Hello to you all and welcome to the Pitcast by us here at the Pit Crew Online. From the fans, for the fans. In today's debrief, we are discussing the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix. F1 made its return to Imola for the first time since 2006 uh, in the third, uh, third Italian race this season. Uh, I am Luca. I am uh, returning to my more typical role as, uh, as host after letting two of these idiots uh, host it a few times. <laughs> I don't mean that. Um, but first up is, We did such a good job. Uh, yeah, well, I know, I know. I, I was beginning to feel scared. Um, first up, as you just heard there, is our deputy editor, James. Hi, Luca. Glad to be back. I'm glad you're here as well. Um, next up, we have uh, the IndyCar um, writer, uh, Adam. Hi, guys. Well, uh, good to be back. And uh, yeah, I hope, uh, hope we do a better job this time, Luca. I'm sure we are. <laughs> we'll give it a good go. <laughs> Oh, we're going to be fired. <laughs> I don't think they can fire us. Anyway, we, I should stop stalling because we do have a first-time uh, appearance on the uh, podcast. Uh, our very own resident Yank. I'm sorry to introduce you like that, Tim. <laughs> yeah, Not Tim. Not the first time. Not the first time. All hey, right, go everybody. on. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Okay. Do you, do you not want to give some background about yourself? Well, um, no, actually, yeah. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is professional. He's a man yeah. of mystery, Tim. <laughs> well, it, it, uh, yeah, I've been, uh, been following motorsports for several years, I think, as all of us have. Um, stumbled into working with the pit crew. Kind of uh, by accident one day, decided to, they had put out a call for contributors, and I've been trying to broaden my writing and and all that. You know, I work in data. I give talks. I, I write articles for for you know database stuff. And decided, hey, I like motorsport. I like writing. I like telling people what I think. Um, <laughs> and so it was a natural fit for the pit crew. I think um, mostly have covered uh, Formula One, but have done some work on the World Endurance Championship, especially some of the the rounds in the United States. Uh, hope to get to to seri- more serious coverage of IMSA and some of the other you know, uh, proper racing series here in the United States. Formula One, of course, I think is, everybody loves it. it it's everybody's favorite, but there's a lot of room for other other things out there as well. And uh, being here in Alabama, we've got some very famous tracks here for American racing and uh, also very close to Daytona. Well, in American terms, very close. For you guys in the UK, it would be like, you know, six weeks journey. <laughs> But it's it's close for us, so <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, looks like Adam stole your job on IndyCar then, because <laughs> that's that that is, that is absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> that is absolutely fine. Uh, Verizon kind of locked up all the, uh, the oh, coverage yes. uh, rights for a lot of things, and so yeah. it's very difficult for for me to to actually watch a lot of the the races unless I was willing to uh, you know sign up for Verizon yeah. uh, for service. So yeah, and I don't. I, I, I don't have Verizon. So. <laughs> all right, then. Well, uh, really to have you all here, gentlemen. Uh, we are discussing the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix. Uh, however, there was, some, there was some driver confirmation news leading up to it. So let's skip through the, the I think, the easy one first. It's um, Alpha Tauri confirmed that Pierre Gasly will be staying on. They didn't confirm Danny Kvyat, uh, which probably gives wind to the idea that he's probably not going to be there next year, um, despite his good result today. Um, but also that Albon might potentially uh, not end up back at AlphaTauri because they're talking about signing Yuki Tsunoda. So there's there's a lot of kind of worms with that, but Pierre Gasly has done a formidable job this year. Everyone's saying he's driver of the year so far. Uh, James, I'm going to pick up your thoughts on it first. Uh, Gasly remaining with AlphaTauri, what does that say about the wider sphere of F1 as a whole right now? I think it's a very good um, decision for the team and for Gasly. It's a very supportive environment that he seems to be flourishing in. Um, I know a lot's been made of the fact that, you know, Red Bull didn't even consider him for the second seat, but I'm as a Gasly fan, I'm kind of glad he's staying at Alpha Tower because it seems to be bringing out the best in him. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what he can be doing in the next couple of years, you know, getting this kind of solid foundation under his belt in the midfield, potentially... I think he's putting together a great CV for himself to potentially move up the grid in a few years' time outside the Red Bull program. Yeah, we've been hearing these um, these rumours that he might end up going to Alpine in 2022 mm-hmm. alongside Ocon. Um, mm-hmm. But 
uh, Adam, I've got to ask you, um, in particular because, well, I know you, you, you're a fan of Carlos Sainz, and he was a driver who managed to leave the Red Bull um, strangleholds, whatever mm. you call them. And, um, Prison. And uh, yeah, exactly. And he's flourished in a way now. But um, Al- we've heard Pierre Gasly <coughs> remaining on at Alpha Tauri, despite the fact that he's won a race, could give win to the fact that Red Bull has realised the error in its ways. In that, Because we always saw Red Bull would give them the drivers three years. And if even if they're doing quite well in that third year, if there's no opening at, uh, at Red Bull, they're out of the door, you know, like mm. the likes of uh, Jean-Eric Byrne and Carlos Sainz. Yeah, so, it, go on. It just, I think Red Bull just seems to be this toxic melting pot of the most, the worst qualities that an up and coming driver, need, driver needs to succeed in a team. Uh, you take, for instance, uh, someone like Pierre Gasly at the moment, who is just outperforming that car, which, you know, in the Constructors' Championship is sort of like a sixth, seventh fastest car, but really is sort of almost best of the rest pretty much since Monza Mugello. And I think that uh, given the experience that Carlos Sainz had, which you just brought up uh, and in the Red Bull program, it just seems to be this cutthroat environment in which uh, time is not on your side and in which limited resources are really given to you to succeed um, in relation to their star driver, which we have to admit is Max Verstappen in the Red Bull. And I think it's no, it's no secret that the development of the Red Bull is tailored made for Verstappen's driving style, which is front end, it's pointy, it's, it's oversteery, it suits Verstappen's driving style. Um, and historically, that doesn't suit many other drivers. Now, um, one argument which is you know, fairly, you know, in, in favour of Alpha Tori for keeping Gasly, is that they are a team in themselves and they want to succeed. They want to get as many constructors points as they do. So it's actually in, it's, been, it's mutually beneficial to the Red Bull family as a whole to have Alpha Tori succeed and maybe even leapfrog the likes of Ferrari or McLaren or Racing Point in 2021 and going further. So if they can get as many, you know, millions more pounds or dollars or euros in their budget going forward, brilliant. It works for all parties. And there's no, uh, there's no assurances that Gasly will succeed going back into Red Bull. Um, personally, uh, people see, you know, think maybe a second time round would, would maybe bring out different results from Gasly. I'm not entirely sure about that. I think whoever goes into that second seat is going to struggle no matter what. Um, maybe we'll touch on who those other people could be that may succeed at some other point. But um, yeah, I think that uh, we've seen time and time again that uh, Red Bull sometimes make mistakes in whoever they choose alongside uh, to go, or, or their philosophy of the driver they tend to favour. So I think it's a good move for Gasly. And uh, yeah, it, it was probably the right move to keep Gasly away from and not get burnt the second time. Yeah, exactly. They, we, we've seen so many drivers come and go from the Red Bull program, like well, obviously Kvyat at Red Bull, and then um, Gasly got getting demoted in favour of Albon, and now Albon looks like he's struggling. And he, he's had a roller coaster season. He had a horror race today. Um, do Tim, I've got to ask you though: is that Red Bull as a whole have really, um, really, had, what's the word I'm looking for? They're really struggling to to pinpoint what it, what it is that's keeping them from being able to have like a, a successful second driver. And it might end up that we could see the likes of maybe Sergio Perez or Nico Hulkenberg in that seat. But Albon surely has to be given more time. And Red Bull have realized now that this is getting to be a point of we are couldn't we are chopping and changing quicker than Henry VIII goes through wives. <laughs> I've used that before. Um, they need they, they, what point do we do? Well, should we as fans be all like, right, this is it now, Albon? If you don't continue, if you continue like this, you are going to be kicked out. Well, I, th- I think to Adam's point, uh, Red Bull has shown over the years that they have an incredibly toxic culture. They have, uh, it, it's sort of been an open secret that it's just a horrible, horrible place for the drivers if they're not delivering consistently. It's not, the, especially the A squad, you know, proper Red Bull, Aston Martin Red Bull racing. Is, is not a forgiving environment. And I believe that, I mean, I, 
I am not the biggest fan of Helmut Marco and Christian Horner by any stretch of the imagination. Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like uh, I saw, and unfortunately I don't have the tweet in front of me, somebody pointed out on Twitter this morning that, hey, at what point are Marco and Horner going to be held to account for the fact that they've had this incredible budget for years and they're still flailing? Um, they've got this long history of putting people in the big chair long before they're actually ready. It's more of an expedient, hey, we've got this promising young driver, let's throw him into the meat grinder and then we're going to completely screw them over in terms of resources and support, as, as Adam said. Um, I think Albon is a great example. I mean, he is very talented. He is a, a, you know, he's got a lot of raw skill, but he's also very young, just like Gasly was just like although i think kviet i think he's kind of um he kviet's really lucky in that you know there are no second acts in red bull well kviet's had like three tries you know <laughs> so kviet's like the 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 miracle child over there um but not i think in a good way and of course you know speaking of kviet today i saw something go by on twitter again man i got i gotta start like screenshotting these things or, or saving the links off so i can actually <laughs> quote people appropriately Sorry, folks, if it's your tweet I'm talking about, you know, good on you. Sorry, I don't remember who you are. Um, where, where Marco was quoted as saying something to the effect that Kvyat's drive today maybe will help him for the future, but it certainly doesn't help him now. And I think what a, what a, what a terribly unkind thing to say. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't mean that Red Bull shouldn't be competitive. I don't mean they shouldn't have high standards. I am thrilled beyond belief that Gasly is thriving at Alpha Tauri and routinely giving the finger to the A squad. Very happy to see that because Gasly is one of those guys that, I mean, the kid's got a future. He's brilliant. He's consistent. He's quick. He's level-headed, but he's utterly vicious on track as well. And that's exactly what you need to succeed. And it's so gratifying to see him doing well again, because again, I think he got put in the big chair in, in the full Red Bull drive before he was fully formed professionally. Mm. And again, he is also very lucky. I mean, we look at what happened to Brennan Hartley. You know, Brennan Hartley's gone on to do very well in other series as well, had done very well, wasn't doing too badly, I don't think, in, uh, in, in, in Ven Toro Rosso. But again, just kind of got mercilessly cut after some things that I think were largely out of his control. But mm. so, so it goes at Red Bull, you know. I think, uh, I think that any of the current drivers would do well, this is my own opinion, would do well to stay away um, if there's a, an open seat, you know, because we've all seen how Red Bull is. And it seems like they and Max get along very well, which is not great for anyone else who happens to be involved in the team. Yeah, I was, um, I was, I was thinking about what you were saying there about uh, Brendan Hartley and Daniel Kvyat, because if we remember, Hartley was actually in the Red Bull program and was actually a peer of Daniel Ricciardo's, and Ricciardo obviously got the F1 drive back in like 2011 and 2012, and Hartley left the program, and then he went and did like sports cars, and he was actually meant to be doing IndyCar before he got his um, F1 call up, and, and also in the case of Kvyat, I just think that they were placeholders. They were just being mm -hmm. there. They were just there until they got the, the chance to step up because if I think if a lot of us could remember back in the end of 2018, the plan was for Dan Tickton, got heaven forbid. To oh. End, oh yeah. <laughs> don't, don't remind me for him to end up in the, um, in the Tara Rosso seat, but because he didn't get the super license points, thank you, Mick Schumacher, because he beat him to the F3 title that year. He ended up not getting those points. Um, and so as a result, Alex Albon got the call up and he was meant to be doing Formula E as a result of a, a deal with uh, Dams to re race in their Formula E team with Nissan. So it is a case now that Red Bull are, because of Daniel Ricciardo, like l l waving goodbye when, the, um, <laughs> when he got the opportunity, he's now caused a, a ripple effect that's really exposed Red Bull as having a really flawed system. Mm. Um, so... so Luca, in terms of the battle between outright doucheness, who would you put above Ferrari or Red Bull right now? <laughs> I would say Red Bull, because they've always been very cutthroat. Um, and th there'll be a lot of people who just say Ferrari because they want to believe that they're sabotaging Vettel That's true. and all that. Yeah. And I, I don't know how much we believe that. I think it's getting a bit ridiculous. Like people wearing tinfoil hats and 
go on Infowars and so be like, they're obviously putting something in Battle Scar that's making the turn of frogs gay or something like that. Sorry, that's a reference you probably lot won't get. <laughs> and I think, I think <laughs> Ferrari, on, Ferrari. Ferrari has, you know, a long history of eating itself as well, but in terms of sheer, as it were, blast radius, they're not anywhere near Red Bull. I would definitely put Red Bull above Ferrari because Red Bull, you know, I feel like their their fallout tends to spread a lot farther. And it could well simply be because they have a huge footprint in sport that Ferrari lacks. You know, Ferrari is mostly confined to the higher ends of motorsport, whereas Red Bull goes everywhere. It's a good and, point. Yeah. And um but you know, with that kind of footprint comes the ability to 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 be just terrible <laughs> in a much bigger in a much bigger way. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I, Ferrari is is known for not having the best internal culture either, starting back you know from the very beginning. But yeah, I, I, I got to give the the nod to Red Bull on that one as well. Well, uh, speaking of Ferrari, this sort of ties into what we have next. Uh, Alfa Romeo, the other Alfa team on the grid, the OG Alfa team, um, they confirmed that they would be sticking to their guns with both Kimi Raikkonen and Antonio Giovinazzi. Now, I have definitely have a few things to say about this. Uh, Kimi, um, clearly he's, he's 40 going on 25 because he's, he's carrying on the way he is and it's formidable, um, even though I do think... If he's probably in the latter half of, of his, uh, well, he is in the latter half, but he should probably be retiring very soon. Uh, if he's still getting good results, he performed very well today, one driver of the day. Um, but regardless, he he's still he's staying there when some other drivers could miss out. That's all fair on him. It obviously works. The bigger picture, oh, for crying out loud, oh. <laughs> James distracted us with. Oh, I've forgotten the cat's name. Uh, what is Dolly it? The pit, Dolly the pit crew cat. Dolly the pit crew cat. Okay, right. Where was I? Um, now, Antonio Giovinazzi is a lot more of a controversial, not controversial in the sense that he's a problematic or divisive character, but more because people give him the real shot and stick in a lot of re- re- regards. Because um, Giovinazzi finished runner up to Pierre Gasly in Prema, uh, in GP2 with the Prema team mm. uh, in 2016. He then uh, had a very sort of like last minute debut at Australia and showed some good pace, but did was a bit sort of rough on the edge and then also had a bit of a, a mare in China the following race but then he missed out a year because they quite rightfully promoted Leclerc instead um, because Leclerc is actually a superstar and then Giovinazzi thankfully got his chance with, uh, with Alfa Romeo for 2019 did, ra- did rather well 2020 you expect him to have stepped up a little bit further and he Sort of has done that, but probably not to the degree that would probably worth keep, keeping him around, especially with the likes of Mick Schumacher, Callum Eilert, Robert Schwartzman, plenty of a plethora of um, F2 Ferrari binded talent in there. Um, so as a result, Giovinazzi is staying, and I'm, I'm happy for that personally, but I do realize that he probably has only one more year at it. So, um, James, do you want to take this first? Yeah, I think if you would have told me at the start of the year that Raikkonen and Giovinazzi would be keeping their seats for next year, I would have been quite surprised by that. Um, well, they're saying that there's a lot of things that have happened this year that I would have been baffled by if you told me back in January. But yeah, I think Raikkonen in the last few weeks, it's become clear he was going to stay there. He's been enjoying this season, even though the car's not been great and doesn't look fun to drive from the outside. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you on the fact that Giovinazzi seems a little bit it's more surprising when you've got, you know, Callum Eilert, Mick Schumacher, Robert Schwartzman all chomping at the bit in F2. And yeah, I, I think even including Schwartzman, who I think is at fifth in the standings right now, they're all capable of moving up to Formula One if Ferrari wanted to. Um, yeah, I I think with Giovinazzi, we've seen him make an improvement this year, certainly. Um, I, I don't think it's quite as much as what Ferrari wanted and what Alfa Romeo wanted, but obviously it's enough to keep them in, keep him in the car. Um, I think the the big thing for me is we know Mick Schumacher is probably going to be going to pass, so it's not going to affect him, but Callum Eilert, I thrill is the one who loses out a lot here because he's second in the F2 championship this year. He's got every chance of winning the title when it returns for the uh, double header in Bahrain. And yet he could be left out without a seat. And I, 
I can't imagine if he stays in F2 next year and goes up against Robert Schwartzman for the title, I can't imagine Eilert getting like another shot. This feels like his kind of best chance really of getting into F1. Um, yeah, and you kind of think, where else is he going to go unless he leaves the Ferrari programme, perhaps? Um, I really hope he doesn't just sort of get cast out into the realms of test and reserve driver in perpetuity. That would be a real shame for someone of his talent. Um, I've got my own uh, sort of theories, not very tinfoil hat theories, on why Ferrari have opted for Giovinazzi over Isla. I wonder if perhaps the year that Giovinazzi spent as, um, or the two years, I think, as Ferrari's development driver and simulator driver, whether they're just thinking with the state that Ferrari's in at the moment with the engine and with parts, I don't know how many parts Alfa Romeo buys from Ferrari, but I assume some, whether they want Giovinazzi's feedback from him being on track every other weekend rather than being in the simulator at Maranello, whether they value that a little bit more than um, yeah, than throwing a rookie into the car whose feedback they're not sure of. Um, yeah, I agree with you, though, that it's perhaps his last chance, um, you know, with Robert Schwartzman maybe needing another year in F2. I think he'll probably be the front runner for that second alpha seat going for 2022. Yeah, I think that's a very plausible theory. It's not absurd in any way. I think you're completely correct, James. Uh, Adam, you got something to say? Well, at the beginning of the year, I thought <laughs> actually Giovinazzi stood out in terms of the head-to-head to Raikkonen. We saw that Giovinazzi was actually the better qualifier in, the, I think, the first four or five races or something. Um, and ever since then, it's sort of, Raikkonen has really stepped up his game and really shown really the young guns that, uh, you know, he's still relevant and still has the speed at his age, which is, uh, and he, uh, you know, formidable um, given the performance he put in today. Um, so it's a little bit on shaky ground, really, for Giovinazzi. And I think he's really lucky to get this seat considering the almost the, the state of the Ferrari Academy. Oh, almost, we're almost saturated, oversaturated with drivers soon to maybe go into F1. And I don't think, I don't know whether that's in Ferrari's interest to have too many Ferrari Academy drivers in, uh, in the current F1 field. And I don't know whether having that many drivers competing for one Ferrari seat down the line is, is particularly helpful for them. I'm, I don't know, but uh, I, I do think he's lucky to keep that seat. Um, And I think that someone who they expected to sort of be the next best thing a couple of years ago has to be doing better against someone of right. I mean, don't get me wrong. Raikkonen is a formidable talent, um, but Giovinazzi needs to be performing more regularly and outscore outscoring him more regularly to make him uh, worthy of a Ferrari drive, which I don't think he's ever going to get. He's missed that, that boat completely. And I think maybe three or four years down the line, we're going to see Giovinazzi in the World Endurance Series driving the air, of course, in the Le Mans Series. And we'll be made, you know, that's his future destination. Or Formula E, um, I really think that next year is his, his final roll of the dice. Um, but we'll go on and talk a little bit more about Kimi Räikkönen's performance today. But yeah. Yeah, I, um, I would very much like to think that Ferrari, are cons- uh, honestly, considering that IndyCar entry that we spoke about beforehand, and maybe Giovinazzi could go there. Maybe even Ilot too. But yeah, if Ilot misses out, I'd be... Because he has been a bit of a bridesmaid. And Giovinazzi as well, in a way. Like, he's um, he's also been shown up quite a lot. And I do believe him to be very good. Um, he, I'm, I'm glad he's staying. Uh, but I do know that it's definitely his last roll of the dice. Uh, Tim, you got anything to add to the uh, Raikkonen and Giovinazzi confirmation? Not a whole lot other than to echo that, you know, it is, it is pretty impressive that, uh, that Kimi has, has stuck around for this long. I mean, good on him. He's, he's you know, he's obviously still uh, earning his paycheck. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm not informed enough about some of the feeder series in, in uh, Formula One, you know, out here in the United States, F2 and F3 really get very little press, very little coverage. I actually have to actively seek it out. And so I'm, I'm a little less aware of some of the dynamics of the junior series and the feeders and, and drivers academies and all that. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like Giovinazzi uh, would be a better choice simply because, you know, I think, I think Kimmy's been there, done that. He, I feel like he's sort of riding out his, his time. Um, he obviously doesn't want to give up, but I, I 
then again, I don't really know what Kimmy wants other than we could all joke and say, well, he just wants ice cream and everything's fine, wants to be left alone. Um, you know, hooray, I've filled, you know, a couple of uh, F1 stereotype bingo boxes. Uh, <laughs> playing our home game. You know, um, but, you know, I, I would like to see Kimmy either, either really crush his junior teammates or move aside and let somebody new come in. You know, he's not it, it, and, and I was thinking about this sort of peripherally, you know, the comments about, you know, is Lewis going to be with Mercedes after Lewis's own comments about, I don't know where I'm going to be. But it made me think about, you know, age in motorsport, because of course you have your older drivers who have, you know, age slows you down. Reflexes aren't as quick. I mean, that's just biology. That's how your body works. But racecraft, experience, knowledge, just that wiliness and understanding of, the vehicles and the psychology, it helped stave off some of those factors. But I, I do feel like I would like to see Kimmy, and you know, I'm sure I'm setting myself up for a lot of hate from, from the Raikkonen fans. And I mean, I love Kimmy's persona in the racing. You know, I, I love the fact that he clearly, you know, has no Fs to give. He'll say what he thinks. He's quite content to, to just, to, to do his job and he does it well, but yeah, been there, done that. Let's move aside, let some of the other guys come up because I would like to see some of the younger drivers get a chance on the big stage. And especially with Alf, you know, Alfa Romeo still being the Ferrari junior squad to, to get these kids there and not have them shuffle off overseas or to, to the United States or to, to Japan necessarily or wherever there's just a spot. You know, it's like, let, let's, let's let the kids have their time. But there is definitely very much a, what have you done for us lately mentality that, you know, it's like, it's great that you won F2, but what have you done for us lately? And, and, and this, this applies across the board from what I've seen. So that, that's my slightly uneducated opinion about uh, the situation of the Ferrari feeder program. and uh, It's all good. <laughs> I mean, the, I, I think a lot of people uh, fall into the trap of trying to assume what they know what they're talking about. It's good to, it's very refreshing to perhaps meet someone who doesn't exactly know everything and makes it very clear. So I think from what you know, that was a good, good opinion. Anyway, um, oh yeah, yeah I, can, so I can BS my way through a lot of things, but I figured out <laughs> right now, you know, I mean, there's no penalty here for being wrong, right? It's, yeah. As you say, it's not like they can fire us. We're not getting paid. Professional. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, don't... Commentary in a nutshell, right? Anyway. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. Yeah. I've got one more thing to talk about. It's that we <clears throat> did hear about a potential 23 race calendar next year. Um, going to Saudi Arabia, boo. We not, no one likes Saudi Arabia. Mm. Um, we, we all know why. But then also, we were talking about, I, th I think we heard something about there would be like two sets of triple headers with like Belgium. Netherlands and Italy, and then also um, <laughs> Singapore, Russia, Japan, and um, now 23 races. We, we were supposed to have 22 this year. It's essentially the 22 we were going to have plus Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, it's getting to a point now where we are possibly going to have to consider uh, very, very extreme measures to ensure that the, um, the people who work to make F1 run efficiently aren't overworked they're not kept away from their families uh, all that sort of thing and to do that we did actually have what well, we were meant to have this weekend be the first case of a two-day um session but then we kind of all got a, got a look in on that at the Nürburgring didn't we when Friday was rained off or fogged off I can't remember exactly and um we had the single session on Saturday uh, this one was meant to be a sing two days from the, from the very start and I think it went very well, personally. Um, it was obviously done to eliminate the strain of having the um, freight carriers moving from uh, all the way from Portugal to uh, northern Italy uh, and have to ha be there for Friday because that was always going to be a stretch. Uh, do we think, with the potential of a, an extremely long race calendar, uh, 23 races, could it be a case that adopting this two-day format uh, work both as a sporting spectacle and a and a means to help uh, lighten the load 
or strain on the F1 personnel. Uh, who wants to take that first? James? Um, yeah, I, I think the two-day format is quite good, especially when F1 is looking at cutting costs and everything. Um, the obvious downside to that is that, you know, obviously fans pay money to go and see FP1 and FP2 on a Friday if they can't afford qualifying day tickets or race day tickets. So there's, you know, obviously less money for tracks and F1, but less opportunity for fans to go and see the cars on track. Um, but yeah, we, we've seen, like you said, with the Nürburgring um, this year, and I think there's been races in recent years, the one that jumps out to me is the 2015 US Grand Prix where uh, Friday was rained off as well. When teams miss out on those three hours of practice on a Friday, we do tend to get a more exciting race because they're going into it with a bit of an unknown. So... Was yeah, it Saturday rained off in that case? Because I seem to remember it was, qualifying it was, was one of the days. Yeah, qualifying was put one. to Sunday. Yeah, they were talking about how they'd arrange the grid if they couldn't do qualifying. Um, yeah, I think it does provide good racing. Um, my worry is that teams would just get used to working in that format yeah. by the end of the year. We've all seen what they're like. They, you know, they reduce the amount of testing every year, and we think, oh, we'll just make the start of the season more exciting because they're going into an unknown, but. The teams get used to it. They get more efficient at running with less time. Um, yeah, with with the 23 race calendar, the thing that worries me a little bit, again, like you said, with the, the strain on the teams and their personnel, we're going into an era with a budget cap in F1 for the first time. And we've seen McLaren and Renault, I think, make it very public. They've had to lay staff off uh, to meet the budget cap. And I think Mercedes have said about shuffling people around like to the Formula E team and other racing teams so that they don't have to lay those staff off because they can't work on the F1 project. And you think before, when we've had packed schedules, one of the solutions would be to have kind of a few rotating pools of staff so that you didn't have the same race team going every weekend. Um, and I, I hope those two goals aren't going to be um, sort of counterintuitive, that we're going to be reducing the numbers of staff at teams and then the staff that are there are going to have to be doing um, like 23 weekends out of the year, almost non-stop, because uh, that would be that would be too big a strain, I think, on on those staff. Uh, another thing to consider with the staff and all that, um, we obviously noted, we realised that these people are obviously trying to just you know pay get paid you know pay their way and all that. So if F1 were to um, allow teams to split staff depending on the amount of races does it then stand to reason that the having two two people playing the same role and having to pay them an equal wage obviously because you can't violate labor laws um that's going to potentially cause a bit of um a concern of having like to pay twice the amount of money just so one person doesn't have to constantly be doing this that same job throughout the entire 23 race calendar season so that that is something that does concern me a little bit because like we have a, uh, one of our contacts, Pit Crew Spy, he works within an F1 team. I'm not going to say who, of course. I don't even know. Why am I even saying that? I won't say because I don't know. <laughs> but my, my point being there is that if they have to then, well, not have to, but they voluntarily say, I would like to be able to sort of split my time, does that mean they get split pay as well? Like, And the other pay goes to that other um, person who then takes up the role within the other re- remaining races. So we've got that to think about. Adam, what do you have to say to that? Well, it may depend on the, the duties that that person can do. I mean, if a B team were to go to the race as opposed to the A team, perhaps they would delegate. Uh, but yeah, the, you know, the, they could, for instance, say, you know, you're not going to the race, but you're going to work on R&D or you're going to work in the... Uh, uh, you know, the the sort of uh, just, prepare, you know, preparing spare parts or logistics or something or other. So I'm sure the teams would be able to figure out a way to do that. Um, you know, w- what I'm a little bit concerned about is in, you know, we've just learned that the UK is going into a lockdown uh, in the next few days um, and the different laws and the different uh, quarantine rules that applies here. Uh, and not only that, around the world, all different countries have their own quarantine rules it's not leaving F1 with a lot of wiggle room in order to kind of handle that or to handle change. You know, there's, it seems very, um, it seems very intensive. It seems, you know, if say one team 
uh, couldn't move there or perform long, couldn't go to one country because of something, it would give them very little time to figure figure something out or or teams to figure something out. So um, I think we have to consider that that in this COVID world where we have to stay flexible and we have to stay changeable in terms of where we go and, and our procedures in our workplaces, um, yeah, it's going to be very difficult for these guys. Yeah, and also because um, you brought up the point there, because we're living in a in a, a world now where F1 is restricting the number of staff and not bringing essential staff. Um, we, even in real life, with um, you know non-essential jobs will be compromised by these restrictions. And again, these people are obviously just trying to complete, like, pay their way in life. And uh, so the people in the F1 paddock who aren't needed or that that's it might be very easy for someone to say well we, if we don't need them then they can go but these are yeah. people that still that they these jobs are very much needed aren't they for them like e- even if not for f1 themselves they these people still need to have an income uh so i mean i, I feel like this is probably very easy for me to say because i'm a uni student i don't have a job you three probably have jobs so uh, I'm not the one that should be, should be saying you don't, Adam. Okay, okay. Uh, t- Tim, what, what have you got to say in response to all that? Yeah, I mean, I think a 23 race calendar is <clears throat> insane. It, it. I mean, you're talking about staff being on the road very nearly six months out of the year, and that is an incredible amount of time. Even if, okay, it's only weekends in quotes, but you've got travel to and from. So there's a day at least, either end. So then you've got three days at home. Plus, you know, you still got to go to the office or theoretically, if you can. And um, again, I, I, feel like the, uh, I feel like the 23 race calendar is more for the rights holders benefit than anybody else's. And I get that. But on the other hand, you know, because as you say, everyone's got to make a living. But... It is, it is too much on the teams. I, what I would love to see would be a shorter calendar, but with maybe some local demonstration events around some weekends close to the team's headquarters. And we do have, of course, you know, okay, certain areas of the UK would be, you know, you can't swing a cat without hitting a demonstration event some weekends. But, you know, there's enough variation to make it interesting, and especially, you know, with with Alfa Romeo being out in Switzerland and, and uh, you know, a couple of folks down in, uh, in Italy could, could be some interesting viewing and some interesting fan opportunities there. Um, but as, uh, yeah, and as far as, I mean, the, the staff redundancies because of the budget cap and because of COVID restrictions and just the realities of living in a, in a pandemic world right now, I mean, I think it will burn a lot of staff out. I think you will wind up with a lot of experienced staff saying, hey, can't do this anymore. Um, but you'll wind up with a lot of staff burnout because you're going, as you, to your point, Luca, that yeah, people have to make a living. People have to put food on the table. They have rent or mortgages to pay. Kids need shoes. Uh, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, we've all got expenses and the vast majority of the team does not get to fly in the fancy private jets. The vast majority of the team doesn't get to stay in the fancy motor homes near the circuit. You know, they're commuting back and forth with, you know, maybe not budget hotels, but maybe budget hotels. I mean, we're not, these guys aren't living the high life that the, the top tier of the teams, you know, the, the principals and the drivers have. And I think it would be good to back off. I of course have a lot of thoughts about circuits that should not be on the calendar for a lot of reasons. <coughs> Saudi Arabia. <coughs> Russia, um, <coughs> China. <not> Bahrain, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We've, we've all got our, uh, you know, and, and that's something that, that, you know, I, I, especially with some of my background in international studies and political science, I have a lot of thoughts about some of these places that, that I will not go into here. <laughs> but yeah, I think the 23 race calendar is just too much. And shortening the weekends, eh, whatever. I mean, to, to, to James's point, you know, everybody gets better at doing more with less. The teams are heavily invested in analytics. I actually know a few people that work for Pure Storage. They do a lot of work with Mercedes. Um, 
so I have some contacts professionally with uh, uh, one of the guys who was on, it may still be, I don't know, I haven't spoken to him in a while, on Ferrari's, uh, Scuderia Ferrari's IT staff. So I'm, I'm very aware of what they're doing with data to the point where I think that they will be able to apply new training models to their number crunching and their analytics <clears throat> very quickly if they need to, to adjust to a shortened week, race weekend, less time on track. It, it will, yeah, it'll spice things up for maybe the first four races on the calendar, but then as they get used to it, as they, the, the, the unknown unknowns narrow down and more things get known and the models improve, it's going to go just back to where it is. I think the budget cap is going to have the biggest impact on race. And of course, you know, they're very smart. The rules engineering is, is one of the most fun things to watch with Formula One. That's where I think we're going to see the most bang for our buck is in the, the sort of the meta of F1, where we start looking at, okay, who has found the craziest interpretation of this rule to get the most bang for their buck and See, I, th I think that's really where we're going to see the most fun from a hardcore fan perspective. You know, everybody who just likes to watch it a couple of times a year, they're going to be like, what? <laughs> but. Go on, Adam. Yeah, I just wanted to do, that's a brilliant point, but I just wanted to touch on your swinger cat reference. I could see James collectively win <laughs> at the thought of uh, any feline uh, no, punishment. Dolly. So, you know. <laughs> well, I was just thinking, too, if you follow my Instagram, I'm pictures of our cat all the time I love, I'm a big cat fan so yeah I was wincing at the amount of F1 festivals we'd have around Luton if they were just <laughs> in the distance of the factories uh, yeah well, imagine like racing point Aston Martin's like little demonstrations like oh just down the street to Silverstone like, yeah right there. 